We are thrilled with any drop of moisture. Can I get a oh yeah from all our Californians here? Absolutely. Many have asked about the fountains here at Pepperdine University. They are off and will remain so until God provides enough water for us to, uh, to be able to, I still hear Keith Lancaster singing overhead, uh, for us to be able to, thanks. Uh, to, to turn them back on. Uh, people ask about our lawn. It is watered with uh, uh, actually non-potable water, so we're trying to do our best uh, during a time of, uh, of drought. Uh, those who have not been here, it is, it is really a serious thing for us, and I want to say we're into four years of drought, so please, as you, you pray for Pepperdine, pray for rain for Southern California. Uh, sometimes, though, it's a good reminder that there are things that are outside of our control. Even as powerful as we think we are, uh, there is a God who, uh, I think somebody said, he sends the rain on the just and the unjust, right? So I believe, he's, believe he still does that. It's always good to be here. Uh, my name is Jeff Walling. I'm still getting used to saying that I serve at Pepperdine University in the Office of Church Relations. And so, yeah, I'm glad to be part of that team. I'm, uh, I'm in the same office I found that uh, years ago, Randy Gill, my dear friend, served in. And even before that, there was a time when I understand Big Don Williams was in that office. So those names mean something to you. You re remember some great history here. The lectures are always a great time to get together, a great time to share good things that are going on. Uh, one of the exciting things that our office is doing this year, I'll talk a little bit more about it tomorrow, is we've received a grant and we're doing a 10-day Christian leadership camp for sophomores and juniors in high school, kids who've just finished their sophomore and junior year. And we, uh, we have a spots for a couple more boys. I'll just be honest with you. We've had like three to one girls uh, apply for this thing. And so if you have a sophomore or junior guy at your congregation, uh, the cost of 10 days here at the Crossways camp this summer uh, is a total of $100. That's food and lodging and everything. And if they're recommended by a youth minister or, or a minister, it's only 50 bucks. So we don't know how we can make it any better than that. I'm excited Mike Cope will be helping to teach it. Uh, I'll be teaching as well as a number of our own faculty and staff here. Uh, Bob Goff is doing a special presentation for us. It, it's it's going to be a wonderful time of learning leadership in the way of Christ, and so we're calling it Crossways. And if you have a student who's interested during the next couple weeks uh, before things uh, all close up, just have them go to pepperdine.edu forward slash crossways for that. It's always good to see old friends. Uh, it's always good to see old friends who don't look that old. I mean, take a look at the person next to you. They haven't aged a bit, have they, right? Absolutely not. Was uh, spoke at a at church where I preached some. I spoke at a little uh, senior's luncheon, and a little 93-year-old lady came up and told me one that I got the biggest kick out of. She said, I, I'm struggling with my memory. I play cards with the same little group of ladies. And I was sitting across from my partner, and I went to say something. And as soon as I said, oh, now stop that, she said, I could not call her name. I have played cards with this gal for 15 years. I could not call her name. And she looked at me, and everybody at the table knew. And I took a deep breath, and I said, I just need to be honest and apologize. I am so sorry. But I'm looking at you, and I love you, and I played cards with you for so long, and I cannot tell you your name right now. And the other two ladies, oh, just covered the mouth, but she just stared at her. Just stared at her. Oh, and you know when the harder you try and think about something, the less you're going to remember it, right? And she was, oh, I know it. It's, uh, uh, and none of the ladies would help. They just all sat back and watched her. She said like a, a fish flopping on the side of the, you know, uh, of the shore without air. And she finally said, oh, please, just tell me your name. Mm. And the lady just shook her head. And she said, how soon do you need to know? <laughs> I... Uh, I can understand more and more of that as the years roll by. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting and exciting. Uh, I was talking to my son. I said, now, Taylor, are you going to be able to come out to, you know, to Pepperdine? And he said, well, Dad, I'm speaking on the program. I said, what? He said, yeah, I'm giving an afternoon class on Wednesday at 3.30. Uh, I said, well, they, 
didn't tell me that. And he said, Dad, they don't have to tell you that. I don't need your permission anymore. And I guess at 29, he's right, you know. He's, uh, he and his wife are married and uh, serving with uh, Rick Atchley at the Hills. And so actually today at 3.30 over in Appleby, he's going to be speaking. So if you want to hear some really good preaching, uh, you can uh, swing by that session. Uh, <clears throat> I, in that same discussion with some of the senior citizens, we got to talking about last words. And uh, the, the thing is, would you like to be able to choose your last words? And so we'll start with some famous last words this morning to get us into the topic and let me introduce a good friend of mine who's here to share with me and so excited about that over the next couple of days. Um, let me put up some, go ahead and put up those, that first last words back there if you would, uh, Mariama. Um, <clears throat> Do you know that is the recorded last words of Winston Churchill? I, I find that very sad, right? I'm bored with it all, history says that he says. Or what about this one here? William Erskine in 1812 was a general who they say may have been losing his mind. And Erskine walked straight out of his office. The problem is his second floor office, he walked out through the window. Uh, fell onto the pavement before he died. He said, now, why did I do that? <laughs> now, you, some of you may guess this last word, who this famous person is. Go to the next one, if you would. Love me tender, yes. Elvis Presley's last words, according to his family, were, I'm going to the bathroom to read. I've decided I will never say that to my wife, <laughs> as I don't want that to be my last words. This is a great one. I'll show you this thing won't shoot. Johnny Ace was an R&B singer, and in 1954, backstage during a break in a concert, he was playing with what he thought was a fake pistol. Yeah, yeah, they had to cancel the rest of that concert. Or this one. I don't know if this is true, but I just got a kick out of it. Uh, the Sharks photographer is saying, smile and show me your teeth. Jim Harkin, I read the other day, laughingly said, he said, you know, I want to die like my grandfather did, peacefully and in my sleep, not screaming and crying in terror like all the other people in his car. Um, <laughs> Jesus knew when he was giving his last words. Can I get a general oh yeah on that? Jesus was not surprised or caught off guard by anything. And so here are the last words of Jesus. Let's read this out loud together. He said to them, go into and preach the gospel to whoever believes and is baptized will be but whoever does not believe powerful and important marching orders as a young minister I believe that this was the single great commission the great command the great marching orders I believe that evangelism and still do was a key call of Jesus I appreciate last night Dr. Wright's words about the power of Christ and the power of that change that happened at 6 p.m. on Friday. But I also was convicted that I needed to teach and preach evangelism. Go and share, go and share, go and tell. Even as to the uh, demoniac, Jesus said, go home and tell what the Lord has done for you. And so sermons and uh, lessons, and I remember being involved in my high school days in something called the bus ministry. Any of you remember the Joy Bus Ministry? Oh, listen, getting up on Saturdays, going out, knocking on doors. It, does it astound you that back in the day you could go and knock on a door and said, Hi, you've never seen me before. An old bus is going to pull up and we're going to take your children. <laughs> and we're probably going to bring them back too. And they'd sign on the dotted line. You know, I don't remember if we had to sign anything other than just get their name. And we'd pull up, and those kids would come running out and get on that bus. And we'd sugar them up and teach them the Bible and take them to church and tell them to sit still and then put them back on the bus and take them back. I had a discussion with my sons that kind of bothered me. Because coming back to California, one of the heartbreaks has been many of the churches that I have visited we're not as large today as they were 17 years ago when I moved away from California, 18 and 19 years ago now. 
And I've had conversations with friends who have said, Jeff, it's just, it's challenging. And I wish it were just Southern California. I wish I could say somehow there's a bubble here that's a problem. But traveling across the country, I find again and again discussions about many restoration churches, churches of Christ, as well as independent Christian churches that are shrinking rather than growing. The argument I had with a couple of my boys was an argument about how we're going to change this. Uh, one of my sons said, well, I think, you know, I think we just brick, we're just done with brick and mortar. And man, hairs on the back of my neck started to stand up. Because I think that was his code for saying, I don't know that we just need to do church like we've always done church. Another one of them said, well, you know, I don't know why we just can't do church at Starbucks. We'll just, we'll just have church at Starbucks. And there are different places where uh, novel ideas like that have, have caught on. But some of the places where that's happening, and I talk to them, and I don't hear them growing and reaching out and sharing the gospel. In fact, sometimes that church at Starbucks can become just as insulated or as isolated as any little brick building or white clapboard building because it's not about where we're doing it, but about what we're doing. Can I get an oh yeah from you on that? How is it that we can live out the call that Jesus put on our life, irrespective of whether it is in a building with a giant cross on the top or it's in a renovated bar or it's at Starbucks or it's at the park? What does it mean to follow through with Jesus' call wherever we are? Well, I need you to know that several years ago when I was serving at the Providence Road Church of Christ in Charlotte, I came across a book that both changed me and kicked my rear. The book was called The Externally Focused Church. Some of you remember a series, I think I did it here several years ago, called The Church on Monday, that was all about how do we continue the battle to break out of the box. Now, not just the box in the sense of the church building, but of our own isolation and insulation. The fact that most of my dear close friends are church folks. Now, I grew up thinking that's the way the world was because my play friends, my church friends, uh, some of them went to school with me, but my life revolved around this wonderful Christian community, which meant when somebody said, you need to go bring a friend to church, that meant my first challenge was, ooh, I need to make a non-Christian friend because I, I really don't have any. In fact, there was a part of me that said, that's kind of dangerous, you know. Friendship with the world. And I'm afraid I may have misunderstood and misinterpreted that text. So reading this little book by a fellow from Colorado called The Externally Focused Church challenged my way of thinking. This book said, what if your church disappeared? Would anybody care? except the members. Yeah, let that bug you for a little bit. That, that's like a piece of popcorn in between your teeth. That'll just, that'll just work on you. If your church disappeared tomorrow, would anybody except the members even notice? So, I contacted him, and he was gracious enough to come to the Providence Road Church of Christ and speak for us, and it really was a turning point for our congregation in reaching out, engaging with the community, and, and a revival of, of, I don't know, what some might call natural or organic evangelism, what I just call reaching out to people around you. And I was so thrilled when that same author and teacher, who has now written two more books on the subject, about to come out with uh, a third called Neighboring, uh, said, yeah, I'd be willing to. Rick Russo serves as the senior minister for the Life Bridge Christian Church in the uh, Longmont, Colorado area. I've been there. They are baptizing people right and left. I've preached for that church. They lift up Jesus and open God's word, and I feel, uh, I feel extremely at home whenever I'm there with that church. In the because Rick is a Bible student. He is a person who believes that God's kingdom is here to change the world. And he is going to share with me and with us together over the next three days. I want you to give a warm Pepperdine welcome to Rick Russo, if you would. First, Rick, thank you so much for your willingness to, to, to be here. Uh, my wife enjoys you and your wife and family. Uh, and I have to confess that when I said, you know, I'm bringing in somebody, and I said, I think Rick Russo is coming in, her words was, the handsome guy? <laughs> yeah. I yeah. said, I thought I was the handsome yeah. guy. And she said, oh, you are. I just so, so that's the only thing about being on, <laughs> see, he doesn't even look good on the screen. Stand here next to me. I mean, this is just, 
Yeah, I know. So <laughs> I'm going to stand over here and you kind of stand. I'll, I'll, we'll I'll we'll give us some space in between. <laughs> How's the trip out been? How are things going? Good, good. Things are, uh, things are really good. You know, one of the things that uh, we're uh, looking at is anytime there's a change in the climate, in, in the history of the world, every organism in that climate has to change. Mm. Uh, it's adapt or die. And we may not like a lot of the stuff going on today, uh, but, but we have to react to it. Uh, we don't have to become it, but we have to react to it. Um, Here's a simple line that if you don't get anything else uh, uh, the next couple days, we have a responsibility to take the gospel that never changes uh, to a world that's never going to be the same. Amen. And what does that look like for us? So that's what we're going to be talking about and looking forward to it. I have a rule when I speak at conventions and conferences is one, never to follow a comedian and never to pair up with a really great communicator. And I've got both with Jeff. So, uh, (laughs) Well, you know, when, when, when you came and, and talked about what was happening at LifeBridge uh, and, and the, the development that was going on there, I remember you talking about uh, getting connected with schools, and you, I think, were the first person that challenged us was the question, what if your church just disappeared? Would anybody else care? But you guys have, have, have moved forward and kind of uh, developed from that forward. Walk us through a little bit of that development and, and share what God's yeah, up to. I think, I think leadership is risky. If you, you're in leadership, and all of us are in one capacity, whether you're a volunteer leader or you're a pastor on your staff, whatever, whatever that looks like, leadership takes some challenge. I lived in Florida uh, for a while. We were in Fort Myers, Florida at a church there. And I went to work for my alma mater, Cincinnati Bible College and Seminary, now Cincinnati Christian University. They were in trouble financially, and I went to help out. And I uh, didn't move to Cincinnati for the first uh, nine months. I commuted. I I would fly out Sunday night uh, out of Fort Myers into Cincinnati. And you know how uh, ministry stuff is. So we were doing it as cheap as we could. And there was an East Coast airline called Florida Express. They were like the Kmart of airlines. They're out of business as well, right? And, and uh, I'm on the plane, and I fly a lot. I travel a ton, and, uh, and half time not even paying attention when, when the plane's taken off. And I'm sitting on this plane, and we're going down the runway, and all of a sudden I realize we've been going down the runway a long time, and we aren't, we aren't, we're seeing stuff I've not seen. And, uh, and the pilot backed off the engines, and, uh, and we rolled. It took several, uh, it felt like minutes, it was probably not that long, rolled to a stop and uh, everybody's paying attention you know at this point and you rev the engines up and down up and down and and then if you fly much you're not going to believe this it was late at night there was no weather he turned the plane and we started going the other direction down the runway and like maybe it was downhill people on the plane leaning forward trying to help out you know how that works and and uh and this time not only did he back off the engines but he hit the brakes and we shuddered to a stop and uh, at this point, everybody is paying attention to what's going on. And there was next to me a woman who was in her mid-70s. She was flying home to Dayton, Ohio to visit relatives. It was the very first time she'd ever been on a plane. Oh. She was the only person not nervous. She'd not done this before. I, I think she was thinking, well, they warmed this puppy up a few times before they <laughs> finally take off. And finally, the pilot came on. He said, folks, we're having a problem with our planes. Like, whoa, really? Hey, thanks for that heads up. And, and then he said this. He said, uh, we're going to go back into the terminal and change aircraft because it's our policy at Florida Express. If there's something wrong with the plane, we don't fly. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good policy for an airline, isn't it? You know? Safety first is a marvelous motto for an airline, but it's a terrible motto to lead by. So I went to uh, First Christian Church in Longmont, Colorado. I arrived, six weeks after I arrived, my wife and uh, our three kids. Our youngest was nine months old, and she now has a six-month-old. We, we've been there a while. We've gotten old there. And um, they were getting ready to celebrate their 100th anniversary. Great church, long history. Uh, attendance was somewhere around 400 people. Really solid, <coughs> long ministry of reaching into the community trying to do this command of Jesus uh, to help people connect with the grace of God in their life. And, uh, and so we started looking at what we were doing, and, and just three years ago, I said to our elders, um, I've helped our church transition two times without killing it. I think I have one more in me before I'm done. And here were the transitions. We went from a traditional model 
um, where we had a stru- very structured Sunday school, and I remember they had that Sunday night light of evangelism program. You remember, don't let the light go out, you know. And so we would we would uh, we'd baptize some stranger just so the light wouldn't go out that night. And you know, very very more traditional model for us in in the way we did ministry. And and I didn't have language for this at the time. I didn't know what to call it, but but I was trying to figure out how could we get people who didn't go to church to come to church. How, how, would, how would we get them to come to us? What were some things? And so many of you have done a lot of things. We started uh, intentional things for students and children's and recovery ministries. And, and uh, we, we did a lot of side door kinds of things that would open the doors. And, and so we went from traditional to more attractional. I didn't know that's what it was called. I don't even like the word attractional. Uh, I'm not sure it describes what we were trying to do, but, but that was the shift for us. And we started growing. In fact, um, we grew a lot. We went from uh, four or 500 to 1,000 to 1,500 to almost 2,000. 85% of those were new believers. Uh, our, our baptistry was just, it was just a cool time in the church. And, and I started wrestling with, but are we making any difference in our city? Are, is anything happening? Is anything changing? And it led to that question. So the first question and we had was that question about how, how could we get people to come? And we're going to look at that question in just a little bit. But traditional uh, to more attractional. Then we went to attractional to more missional. How is it that we could go? What would it look like? And we didn't have the word missional at the time, and it's another word I don't particularly like. We started calling it externally focused. We didn't even know what to call it. We just said, how could we uh, get connected and reach people outside our doors? What would it look like if we got involved? And so we started getting involved in uh, public schools and in some other ways. And there's some very cool things, and hopefully over the next few days I'll share some stories. But let me give you a very quick one. We started getting involved in helping uh, Boulder County uh, we're in one of the least religious counties in America, deal with one of the problems they have, which was in the foster care system. And so we started working, uh, recruiting foster care parents and getting them involved and engaged. And today, uh, not only have we uh, provide half of the homes, foster care homes for two county, but we help the state of Colorado deal with a population of kids uh, who are eligible for adoption but not adopted. And we've taken that number from 800 children who needed adoption uh, down to under 180. And we are working in eight other states now with an organization that we've launched called America's Kids Belong. Uh, I'm going I'm to share a video with you, I hope, at the end of the week about, about what's happening with that. But what I'm watching was how could the church get involved and how could we get engaged and how can we be involved in the real issues around us. And so we got involved and externally focused. And that's led to this transition we're in right now. And that is, how would we go from more missional to more incarnational? Not just how are we doing this corporately, but how, how is that happening individually for us? What's happening in our lives that's allowing us to reach the people around us, to get our own folks engaged in, in uh, growing, um, in becoming the people they ought to be, and living their faith out. And all of us want to do that. I, I don't know anybody in church who is saying, no, no, we don't want people to live their faith out. That's not what we're at. All of us are after that. Uh, but how can we do it at a practical level? I've told Jeff, I'm just a practitioner. Um, and I've, I've looked for ways uh, for us to be engaged. A couple summers ago, two summers ago, I took my uh, two oldest granddaughters, Addie and Bria. Uh, Addie was five at the time, Bria was three. Uh, we have a place over in Lake of the Ozarks, and so we went there. Lake of the Ozarks is rural, uh, and uh, we love being over there. It's, it's a great place for us. And so we get over there, and the very first day, uh, the youngest Bria is taking a nap, and Addie and I are sitting on the back deck, and she says, Papa, can I get your iPad? I want to watch a movie. And so she got my iPad, she downloaded a movie, and five minutes later she's watching some Disney movie sitting on the back deck in Lake of the Ozarks, rural Missouri. And my granddaughter thinks, this is how it's always been done. (laughs) This is how everybody gets movies. Some of you in the room are old enough to remember that if you didn't watch Wizard of Oz on the one Sunday night in October that ABC was showing it, you were hosed for the entire year. You weren't going to see that again, right? And then, and then we got to where we had VHS, right? We had the videotapes, and then we went to uh, Blockbusters, and then it was Redbox and Netflix, and now it's Hulu. And, uh, 
And I was taking a group to Israel several weeks ago during the March Madness tournament. I'm a diehard Syracuse University fan. I grew up in, in Syracuse. And I watched the game on my phone as we were going down the runway. Shh, don't tell them I didn't turn it off. Okay. <laughs> Things changed. Something shifted. How many of you have a blockbuster building in your town that's not a blockbuster anymore? Do you know in 2004... They had 9,000 stores in the U.S. and 14,000 stores in North America. They filed bankruptcy in 2014 in November, and in 2015, last spring, last April, they closed all of their retail outlets. And you can drive down your town right now, and you can say, hey, that used to be a blockbuster. <laughs> they missed the turn. Movies was their business, <laughs> and they missed the turn. Well, we're in the business, aren't we, of, of following those words of Jesus, <laughs> his great commission to us. And yet church after church after church after church in America has missed the turn. And so the questions that... Jeff was talking about that we led on was how do we get people to come to church that aren't coming to church? And, and then we asked this question if our church disappeared, would anybody care? Would it really matter to anybody at all? And, and then we asked the question how can we be the best church in our community or for our community, not in our community? And there's a difference in that. How do we be the best church for our community, not the best church in our community? Because the truth is, a lot of us want to be the best church in the community. We want to have the best preaching, the best music, best kids thing, best building. We asked, what would it look like if we were the best church for our community? And that's what drove us to where we are now. And that question is, how do we get better at the two things that Jesus said mattered most? What if, what if we did a better job today than we did yesterday of loving God? And what if we did a better job today of loving our neighbor? What if people at LifeBridge actually love their neighbor? So now here's the question that I've been asking personally in the mirror. If I disappeared from my neighborhood, would anybody care? Would it matter? Am I making any kind of difference in my neighborhood as a Christ follower? And that's a challenge we've been giving our people. How do we get better at the two things Jesus said mattered most? What would that look like for us? What, what, what would it mean if we could do that? Because we're kind of in trouble in America. Let me give you some very quick stats about that and, and, um, and what we're seeing. Um, in 2007, uh, the U.S. population was 220-some uh, million uh, people. And in 2014, we grew 18 million people, and yet we've declined 7% in the number of people in the U.S. who would identify themselves as Christians. Um, we, we're looking at, uh, there's always been this steady attendance of church attendance in America. About 40% of people in America uh, attend church, and that number is declining for the first time since we've been measuring that number uh, in the early part of the 19th century, the 20th century. Um, 30 and a half million people in the last three years have said they're done with church, not going to church anymore. And here was an interesting thing I learned from Josh Packard, who's done all the research around this, is I thought that, well, you know who that is. That's the, that's the younger crowd. That's the millennials. They're the ones who are bailing on church. You know, the average age of the Duns is 40, highly educated, and the bulk of them served in the church somewhere. So we're not talking about people who are saying, ah, I'm marginal. We're not talking about the people who are going, hey, I kind of showed up. The two fastest growing religious categories in the U.S. today are the duns and the nuns, <laughs> meaning I have no affiliation. A part of that reason, and I'm not one of those doomsdayers with the sky is falling on us, part of it is that nominal Christianity is over today for the most part. There was a time when you would check I'm Christian on the census box because there was some value to you for that. There was a reason to say that. Um, there was a benefit to identify as Christian. Today, actually, we live in a culture where identifying yourselves as a Christian is a negative, not a positive. And so more people are checking the box of done. And there are, there are nearly, uh, I think, for, how many, what's that one next to that? I think it's seven and a half million who are saying, we're almost done with church. 
We haven't left yet, but we're going to leave. And here's part of the problem, is we've made so much of our emphasis and focus around the weekend service. The average church in America spends over 75% of its resources on the weekend, on the gathering. And if you're a pastor, think about this. We gear up for the weekend, right? We're, we've got a lot of energy going into it. And then we come out and we're kind of worn out after the weekend. And I get that when you're preaching and you're engaged, you're doing people things and all of that. But, but we started looking at LifeBridge. What would happen if we spent as much time focusing on scattering as we did on gathering? What would that look like for us? What would it look like if we invited our people not to just be coming for the weekend experience, kind of to sit and watch sometimes, but what if we help them get engaged? And that drove us back to this simple thing. What if we could just get them to love their neighbors, to really love, to follow this command of Jesus? You know, Matthew 22, uh, Jesus speaks those words. He was asked, uh, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And there were several times where we find this in, in the scripture, uh, different accounts where uh, Jesus gives us, what, what's the greatest commandment? You know what that was about. That was, there were 613 Jewish laws. There was no agreement uh, about what, what command was the greatest. And so this was the way to trap him because if he identified with any of the commands, there'd be a certain sect of the Jews that would be uh, excited about that and a certain sect that thought he was headed in the wrong direction. And so this was a divisive question, not the first divisive question in religious history of the world, right? What's the greatest command? And you know the answer Jesus gave. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with your strength. The Shema it goes back to Deuteronomy. But it wasn't just a command, it was a proclamation, actually. When you follow the history of that, it was identifying with God. It was a person proclaiming that not only, it was very much what, what uh, N.T. Wright was saying last night. It wasn't just that there was this thing we did so that we've been saved somehow, redeemed so that we're going to go to heaven. This was actually saying, I am going to shift who I am as a human because I'm identifying with the God of the universe. And so I want to love him with everything I have. I want to love him with all my heart, all my emotion, all the, all the good, bad, and ugly about that. The, I want to love him with my soul, all, all that is in me, all who I am, all my past, all my present, all my future. I want to love him with my mind, all my intellect. I don't want to check my brain at the door. I'm going to think through this. And all my strength, in other words, everything I'm doing, every ounce, every fiber, and, and that's not easy, is it? I mean, I love God, but I love some other things. <laughs> I love my wife. I love my kids. I really love my grandkids. <laughs> really grateful I didn't kill my kids. <laughs> I, 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 love, I love the Buffalo Bills, which is, if you follow the NFL, that, that's hard. I mean, they lost four Super Bowls, so you know what bills stand for. Boy, I love losing Super Bowls. That's what, that's what I, I... I love, I love Oreo cookies. <laughs> love Oreo cookies. And sometimes I love Oreo cookies more than I love God. I love God, but I love other things. Whatever your bag of Oreos is, right? Those things that get in the way, the things that matter more to me, the things that I want. Do you know sometimes, sometimes I've loved my ministry more than I've loved God. Sometimes as church leaders, we've been asking the wrong questions. It'll happen out here in the hallways and over at the Waves cafeteria, isn't it? We get more subtle about how's attendance. <laughs> How many people have you baptized lately? How's your giving? We focus around butts and bucks and baptisms. <laughs> Loving God's hard. So Jesus said, that's the greatest commandment. <laughs> Love the Lord your God with every fiber of your being. And then he said, and, and the next one's just like it. Love your neighbors yourself. Whoa, my neighbors? I don't, I don't even like my neighbors. 
Love my neighbors. Love my neighbor. Love my neighbor like I love me, which means I've identified with God because God, I want to lo- love him, love my neighbor like that. What would happen? What would happen if you were the best neighbor your neighbor ever had? What would that look like? What would happen if the people in our church would love God and love their neighbors? I don't know how many, uh, Jeff, we talked about square footage of church building stuff. I don't know how many square feet we have of church buildings around the country. Millions and millions and millions of square feet. But the most underutilized spiritual space in America are the homes of the people who have identified with God. Those kitchens, those living rooms, those backyards. What would it look like if we loved God and loved our neighbor? What, what, what changes have to happen for me? What, what kinds of things become a priority for me that weren't a priority for me? What, what shifts? And for us as a church then, we started asking the question, well, if we're going to have people actually love their neighbors, what are some things we're not going to be doing anymore? Because here's how Christianity has worked for a whole bunch of us. We get in our car and we drive to some facility somewhere. All right, we drive out of our neighborhood and we drive to a building somewhere and we have a Bible study and we have class, we go to a worship service and those are good things. I, I'm not in that camp that says, let's just get rid of the gathering. It, Jesus had something to say about coming together. The Bible had something to say about meeting together. There's a reason we gather. There's some importance for that. I, I think tossing out the gathering is the worst idea we've ever had because we've got to get together. But what if, what if our focus wasn't gathering only? What if we thought as much about scattering as we have on gathering? What if we helped our people do that? So if you took, if you took however many families you have in your church, a hundred, a thousand, and you took the eight closest households to them, the eight condos around them, the eight people in their cul-de-sac, the eight farms in their rural area, the eight closest neighbors they had, and, and if that family in your church was loving God and loving their neighbor, really loving God, loving their neighbor, we could help that happen in their lives. Your church's ministry opportunity would be eightfold from what it is today. We measure from a 20-minute drive of our facility. That's how we used to measure things. We got a chance of reaching people who are kind of within 20 minutes. And then, like many of you, we started some other campuses. Why? So we could expand their reach. And and we were missing, we were missing how expansive we could be if we could just get better, if we could just get better at those two things that Jesus said mattered most. Mm -hmm. Love God and love my neighbor. And so that's what we're going to be talking about over there. I hope to give you some really practical stuff around that and some basic things, we've, do's and don'ts that we've learned along the way. Well, I'll throw a couple of challenges at you right off the bat, and we'll tackle some of these tomorrow. Um, you know, as, as I read and, and uh, Rick's work and, and, uh, and work with churches across the country, churches of Christ that are wrestling with this, you know, as our nation, you know, because we could put another set of stats up there. We could put some stats up about morality in America. And we could find ourselves scratching our head and saying, my goodness, how did this happen? About arguments over, <clears throat> over uh, whether or not you can use a certain bathroom or not, or arguments over who has to make a bridal cake for whose wedding, or, 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 right? And so some families say, man, my best shot at getting my kids to heaven is to build a wall around our family. Is, is to protect our family. They would grab onto Paul saying, come you out from among them kind of thing. And yet Jesus, I, I was talking to a friend and I said, you know, Jesus was out there with the sinners and the tax collectors and, and he was accused of being with people who drink. And my buddy said, yeah, he was Jesus. And he had all that Jesusness about him that gave him the ability to do that. And he said, do you think Jesus expects us to do that? And I said, well, if he didn't expect us to do that, then what's with this line, go into all the world? Uh, One vision that I'm afraid I I probably had, Rick, growing up, was that the church was the castle. It was the castle of salvation. And once a year, we had our gospel meeting. 
And we would let down the moat, rush out, beat up and grab people and pull them back in <laughs> and shut the moat, right? Exactly. And, and there were more people in the castle than at the end of the gospel meeting. But what, what you're challenging us to think about, and I think biblically and appropriately, is to ask this question. You served as a missionary, right? At one point? Mm -hmm. No, who, who were we talking about? We were talking about uh, Monty Cox was over at the house from, uh, from Harding University. And we were talking about his, about his mission work. And, of course, you just answered that question wrong. You realize that. I did. I did. I, I have served as a missionary. Absolutely. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> how many of you know a missionary? Anybody here know? By name. You could name a missionary. Okay. I want you to take your hand like this and put it towards me. Go ahead. Now, I want you to tap the person next to you. You just tapped a missionary. <laughs> you, you, you realize that, right? You don't have to go to Tanzania. You don't have to go to the Ukraine. You don't have to go to Costa Rica because we live in a mission field. We do not live on home court. We're playing. We're the away team. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, looking down our nose. So what does it look like for us to imagine that you, say your address out loud for me. If you can't, don't feel bad about it. I, I've had those days too. <laughs> I want you to imagine that you have been dropped in as a mission outpost from God in that address in that neighborhood. What would it look like for you to neighbor as a missionary? We're going to pick up tomorrow right there and give you some practical ways of how we can live that out. I look forward to that. I'm excited about things that Pepperdine is doing to try and help churches do that very thing. In fact, uh, please pray for our, uh, this, this Friday at 8.30, um, four young people who are our next-gen preacher search finalists are going to be speaking at 8.30 over in Smothers. You will not want to miss that. Uh, just gifted, gifted young people. In fact, one of them I think came in here. Max, are you around? Are you in here? Did you fall asleep or go to another class? No, you're down here. Stand up for a second, Max. Max is 16 years old. Am I right? 17. Just turned 17. <laughs> from Columbus, Ohio. He, uh, and he, and he, he sent in a little five-minute video of himself. The kid is gifted. Kind of scary. Kind of scary. Uh, I hope you are blowing under the wings of students at your churches. And if you're interested in how more to do that, see, see me afterwards. I'd love to share some of the things we're doing with you. But we're going to pick up right here tomorrow. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Rick. Thank you for this time. Thank you for these people. But Lord, for a moment, may we pray about our neighbors. Lord, may we pray about the people who live across the street, behind us, next to us. May we pray about the people we bump into so regularly at the supermarket. We know their, know their names. May we pray about the people who drive right past our house and whose houses we drive right past. God, thank you for that mission field for us to love them like you've loved us. Oh, God, give us the courage, the passion, the selflessness to do that. And guide us as we talk about this over the next two days. I pray in Jesus' holy name and all that agree say, amen. Thank you, and thank you, Rick. Absolutely.